and and pass pass uh, from pathology we remember it's um it's a collection of dead uh, microorganisms dead lymphocytes uh, dead inflammatory cells and markers plus exudates from uh, the body so that combination of some white tissue brain discharge as we call pus and um, uh, when we have an, a collection of it in a given area, that's why that's when we use the word abscess. So abscess is a collection of pus. And today we are looking at common ENT abscesses. Okay, so the contents uh, today we are going to look at, we are going to look at pharyngosis, uh, preauricular sinus abscess, uh, septo abscess, peritonsillar abscess, also known as quinsy, retropharyngeal abscess, and external neck abscess. Uh, we are going to start with an ear pharyngo or pharyngosis. Uh, it is a localized form of otitis externa. Uh, it results from infection of a single hair follicle. So it occurs in the outer third of the ear canal. Why? Because we know the outer third is the cartilaginous part, which is also lined by skin, and the skin contains hair follicles. So those hair follicles in the outer third of the external auditory canal uh, can get infected and they give you what we call a pharyngo. The risk factors are include heat, humidity, trauma, um, immunodeficient states like uh, diabetes mellitus. So these are risk factors for someone to get a pharyngo in the ear. Uh, there are other risk factors that we come across, uh, for example, in patients who have separate dermatitis, also reliable or liable to get um, pharyngos in the, in the external auditory canal. Uh, symptoms of um, uh, pharyngitis in the ear include otalgia, that is ear pain, fever, and hearing loss. And on examination, you find that the, we have tenderness on palpation of the pinna, also on palpation, if you have a plastic curate and you try and palpate the external tear canal in the affected area, still the patient who you'll be able to elicit tenderness. And um, on otoscopy, you'll see this, as you can see in this image, you have a, a swelling that is fluctuant. And um, on 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 lymph node examination, the patient might also have a pre-auricular or level two cervical lymph nodes. And the stages of a pharyngo, we have superficial and pointed, which you see in this, this is superficial and pointed, or it can be deep and diffuse. So once you've made the diagnosis of pharyngosis, we uh, come to know that the um, causative agent in pharyngosis is Staphylococcus aureus. So you need to treat the patient. One treatment includes systemic antibiotics uh, consisting of beta lactamase resistant penicillin, uh, such as amoxiclav or glucamox, or quinolones, such as uh, ciprofloxacin. Then we give the patient analgesia and topical antibiotic with a steroid. So you can also give an ear drop. In, in cases where we have the pharyngo that is ready, um, that is more fluctuant, we uh, go ahead and do incision and drainage of the pharyngo. And we sometimes need to put what we call an auto wick or an antibiotic impregnated wick may be inserted temporarily if there's significant ear canal edema and narrowing. This, this helps to keep the ear canal patent when it heals and each healing when it's collapsed. 
So treatment of afarancol, if it's not ready, give antibiotics, give analgesia, give a topical ear drop. If it's ready, do iron incision and drain it, and then you put a, an antibiotic impregnated wick, help the ear to heal when it is um, open. Uh, complications of pharyncos in the ear, we have infection might spread to the penis, so you, the patient might get perichondritis. Uh, postauricular skin, then they'll get postauricular skin edema, all to the parotid gland, then they will get CLO adenitis. Uh, repeated infections, if someone has had recurrent pharyncos in the ear, sometimes lead to permanent scarring of the external lingual canal with fibrosis and stenosis. So scar, scarring, we know, we understand what scar is. So the scar with fibrosis need to narrowing. Stenosis is narrowing of the external auditory canal. Uh, we also have what we call preauricular abscess. So we know that the auricle comes from what we call, if you can look at this image, the one where we have the, the, the pointer, this is a, an, this is a fetus. So this is the part of the fetus that develops into the pinna or the auricle. And the auricle originates from six mesenchymal cell swellings that fuse together to give you the ear. Uh, so we can say God is, is an artist. So, um, so one, two, three, four, five, six helots, uh, uh, helocs, they are called helocs, um, which are from mesench which has mesenchymal swellings. They come together and they join and they fuse and, and give you what we call the, the oracle. So in failure of this fusion to occur without any event, uh, there are different events that can occur to, to hinder the, the fusion of these helicos and helox together. And that's what forms the preauricular sinus or the preauricular pit. So we can have, a, uh, there are so many different locations where um, the pits can be formed, but commonly we have this, uh, the pit that we usually find anterior to, that you usually find anterior to the root of the helix. This is the helix. So the root of the helix, we have this preauricular sinus. And then we also have others. It can occur here at the concha ball or at the tragus. It can occur anywhere along where the helix were fusing. Excuse me. So in fact, uh, usually we have seen patients with these preauricular dimples or pits, whatever that phenomenon is, and we don't do anything about them. Some people even say that this, this pits run in their family. However, this pit can, because it's a pit that contains a sac, as you can see in this image. So this is the pit. As you follow it, the pit is actually connected to a sac. And the sac, you see this sac? The, it has a sinus and the sac sits onto the cartilage. So this sac can get infected and becomes big. When it becomes big, that's when we have what we call an abscess because this swelling usually contains pus. Uh, infection involving the congenital preauricular pit is what we call as a preauricular infection, which can, which is usually predisposed, uh, causative agent is Staphylococcus aureus. Um, the, it's the patient presents with pain and a swelling which is anterior to the pinna. And treatment is and by check analgesia and incision and drainage. So you will make us, you, you palpate and confirm that it's a, a 
extract one, then you put, you place your needle and you aspirate past to confirm that it's strictly an abscess. Then you aseptically uh, make a horizontal incision, non vertical, because of the superficial temporal arteries. So you don't want to cut them um, hori uh, horizontally. So we make a, a vertical incision and, and, and we drain the pus. Then you introduce your artery to uh, cause locul. locul Loculysis that is breaking the locules and then irrigate and pack with tetracycline coated gauze. The reason why we pack in any abscess drainage is because we want to prevent the opening we have made from sealing off before we we before the wound has completely drained or healed. Um, definitive management is excision. Once the infection has settled, maybe uh, two weeks, uh, six weeks later, then you go ahead and plan and excise the entire sac and its entire sinus with its sac with a rim of cartilage. So that's the definitive management of preauricular sinus. And we only manage it if it has been infected. So if a patient has any preauricular it, that is not troubling them, it's good to leave it as it is. Uh, then next, uh, we are going to talk about nasopharyngeolosis. So nasopharyngeolosis is an acute infection of the hair follicles in the vestibule of the nose. The hair follicles in the vestibule of the nose are also known as vibrissi. And just as the root of the hair follicle anywhere can get infected. This can also get infected. Uh, the microorganism, usually it is the pylococcus aureus, as we have seen in our previous slides, and risk factors for nasopharyngeolosis mean include trauma, that is nasal picking, putting your finger or putting the hanky and ring and rubbing the nasal vestibule tranquilla. Um, any secretions or irritation, then immunodeficiency states are uh, HIV, diabetes, uh, and patients on long term steroid use. Um, symptoms include nasal pain. So, a patient will come in with pain, they'll say that I have a pain that is located along the nasal ala and swelling in the nasal tip. So this pharyngeal is born in the lower, on the floor of the vestibule, whether we can have on the lateral wall of the vestibule or on the roof of the vestibule. Rarely will pharyngeals form on the septum because the septum is deep, is, um, um, we, we rarely have hair follicles. We do not have hair follicles on the septum. Uh, symptoms, as we have seen, pain and swelling of the nasal tip. And uh, signs we have tenderness and swelling in the vestibule. So when you touch on a clinical exam, the patient will, will have pain. Uh, management is warm compression. So you can compress with a warm towel and analgesia. Uh, that is pain management, uh, topical and systemic antibiotics. And if one, so if it forms an abscess, just like you see here, we can do incision and, and drainage, um, incision and drainage. So kindly, we need to note that in no case should a pharyngeal be squeezed or prematurely drained because of the danger of spread of infection to the cavernous sinus through venous thrombophlebitis. So we remember when we were growing up, our grandparents used to tell us, um, do not squeeze anything in the nose or the upper lip. 
it will cause you death. I think you all remember that. I, I also had it when I was young. Because this part of the nose, which we call the anterior, the danger triangle, the tip is between, I said, the glabella or the nasal bridge, and then it goes to include the whole nose and the upper lip. So the reason why this is not advisable to tamper with a pimple or a pharyngo in this area is because the flow of blood in all these tributaries and communication are reversible as they process no valves. So the blood vessels that drain this area do not have valves. So blood will flow back and forth, back and forth. And the spread of infection can lead to thrombosis of the cavernous sinus. The cavernous sinus is sinus found in the intracranium. The cavernous communicates with the danger triangle that is root two, root one, the superior ophthalmic vein, and the deep, Facial veins. The deep facial veins end up in the teligo as of the vein and the emissary vein. So, if a patient comes to you and you examine and you find that they have a swelling that is still firm and tender, then first give antibiotics and then wait for it either spontaneous rupture or they come back with, to you for review if the swelling has become um, ready for drainage. Uh, complications of nasopharyngeosis uh, include cellulitis of the upper lip, like we see this uh, patient. He had a nasopharyngeosis, which complicated with the upper lip, and uh, septal abscess, as we shall see later, and all cavernous sinus thrombosis. Um, that is all with nasopharyngeosis. Now we are going to look at septohematoma and septopsis. So what is a septohematoma? Septohematoma is a collection of blood between the mucopericondium and the mucoperiosteum of the septum. So the nasal septum, we, as you saw, it has both the cartilaginous part and the bony component. And it's covered by the mucopericondrium and the mucoperiosteum respectively. So sometimes uh, risk factors which are like nasal trauma, septal surgery, or bleeding disorders, they lead to collection of blood between this layer and the cartilage, and the septal cartilage, excuse me. And that gives you what we call a septal hematoma, as you can see in this patient. So you have, uh, so a patient will come in with bilateral nasal obstructions, mouth breathing, frontal headache, and a sense of pressure over the nasal bridge. So they feel like the nasal bridge is falling off. And on examination, which is the nasal exam and anterior rhinoscopy, we find that we have bilateral smooth swellings, as you can see bilateral smooth, this is a black patient. So you see bilateral smooth swellings that are soft and fluctuant on either side of the septum. Uh, management, once you've made the diagnosis, we do incision and drainage. So you make an incision, maybe horizontal on one side, then vertical on the other, and um, you, you, you drain the pus. And once you've drained, I mean, you drain the, the blood. So once you've drained the blood, then you have to put um, a nasal, uh, the anterior nasal pack. So this is a paraffin or Vaseline gauze. Vaseline gauze. So you, you, pack, you pack the nose so that you prevent reaccumulation of the blood before the patient has fully healed. And, um, you also give the patient antibiotics and analgesia. Then after five days, you can remove the nasal pack, three to five days, depending on the patient. Uh, complications of uh, septal hematoma include permanently thickened septum. So the septum can become thick, or it can progress to a septal abscess, or we can have what we call cartilage necrosis. 
Um, so if a septal hematoma progresses, it can give us what we call a septal abscess. So a septal abscess is, is a collection of parts between the septum cartilage, the septal cartilage and the mucoperichondrium or the septal bone with the mucoperichondrium. So it's just um, as we saw in the previous slides. The etiology usually could be from secondary infection in the septal hematoma or a pharynco in the nose that has spread to the septum all acute infections such as typhoid and, and measles. This cause collection of exudates within the mucoperiosteum, uh, and the cartilage, and that can become secondary infected, and that leads to a septal abscess. Other symptoms include severe bilateral nasal obstruction because cavity, uh, pain and tenderness over the nasal bridge, fever, chills, and frontal headache. So the patient will have fever, chills, and a frontal headache. The signs we shall have reddening over the skin on the nose. Sometimes in blacks, it's hard to tell the red color, but you notice that the nose is swollen. And on anterior rhinoscopy, you appreciate smooth bilateral swellings of the nasal septum, as you can see in this image. These are a nasal septum. And the patient, the uh, mucosa, as you can see, the septal mucosa is edematous, is hyperemic. And the patient might ha also have uh, cervical lymph nodes, usually in the submental and submandibular triangle on clinical palpation. Uh, treatment of this septal abscess includes incision and drainage with nas nasal packing. So it's the same we do here. However, we put in glove drains before we do the nasal packing so that we allow the pus continue draining um, until, it, and, 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 until it has completely drained. And then we give the patient systemic antibiotics and analgesia. Complications include one, septal perforation. So if you make one the incision on the same level on either side as you drain. Most of the time, what you do this side, or you do it this side. So you drain them bilaterally. So sometimes you can need to accept to operation. Or if already we have cartilage necrosis, there will still be a communication on either side. So that is septal perforation. Um, if it heals, then you can have with cartilage loss, you can have a saddle nose deformity for those who know post bugs and infection can also spread because of the danger triangle of the face. It can spread to the brain and give you meningitis and cabinous sinus thrombosis. Remember to not touch or harm a pimple in the danger triangle of the face. So that is all to do with the septal abscess. Um, we are going to proceed to what we call peritonsillar abscess or quinsy. So we all remember that we have the palatine tonsils. The palatine tonsils we saw when we were talking about the oropharynx and the wild ears ring. And we said on either side of the ovula between the anterior and posterior pharyngeal pillars, you have the palatine tonsils and collection of pus in the peritonsillar space. So the peritonsillar space is that space that lies between the palatine tonsillar capsule and the superior constrictor muscle. Uh, we also looked at the superior constrictor muscle when we looked at the pharyngeal wall and the pharyngeal, uh, yes, pharyngeal wall, and we saw that um, that the um, uh, the, the superior constrictor muscle is part of the muscles that form the wall of the pharynx. So Quincy is the collection of parts in the peritonsillar space, which is between the capsule of the tonsil and the superior constrictor muscle. So this is a tonsil. 
and this is the anterior and that is the posterior. So what this is relatively normal though the mucosa is hyperemic, but here we can clearly see that we have a bulging involving the soft palate, the ovula, and it's medializing the tonsil. It's bringing the tonsil into the middle and also lateralizing the ovula. So this part that we see is what we are talking about as quinzy. Etiology of quinzy, uh, uh, one, we have superative tonsillitis or recurrent tonsillitis, include streptococcus pyogenes, staphylococcus, um, aureus, group A, man, group A, B, T, hemolytic strep, and uh, anaerobes. So, mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm sorry about that. So etiology, we were saying we have recurrent tonsillitis or superative tonsillitis, and we say this is polymicrobial. So we have streptococcus pyogenes, staphylococcus aureus, and anaerobes. Okay and then foreign body in the tonsil. So if you look at this corner where my, my arrow is, you can see we have recurrent tonsillitis infection in the tonsils. And then we, we saw that the tonsils have deep crypts. So this infection causes fibrosis of the tonsillar crypt or the pockets that you see, these pockets that sometimes keep food and you find that you have a tonsil only coming out. So closure of this tonsillar crypt due to the new infections, uh, infection remains within and it, and, and, and it causes an intratonsillar abscess. So the abscess first starts within the tonsil itself and then it ruptures. When it ruptures, it causes peritonsillar cellulitis which progresses to a peritonsillar abscess. So these patients come in with symptoms of fever, or dinophagia, drooling or dipping of saliva because they have dysphagia, uh, pseudo dysphagia, so they cannot swallow. They have trismus, trismus is failure to open the mouth fully. Uh, muffled voice, uh, that means that the voice will be obstructed from coming out because of the, um, uh, the, the um, infection. Then we have halitosis, uh, which is uh, smelling of the mouth. Otalgia, because the nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve, which supplies the tonsillar bed, also has a component that goes to the, the ear. Usually they have what we call refined pain, otalgia, and tender enlarged cervical lymph nodes. So they also drain into the jugular, the gastric nodes. Uh, so symptoms, we say fever or dinophagia, drooling or dripping saliva, Christmas, muffled voice, halitosis, otalgia, and tender in light cervical movements. So on oropharyngoscopy, after doing oropharyngoscopy, you'll find that you have a lateralized edematous ovula, which you can see in this image, and a medialized tonsil. You see this tonsil? has been pushed to the midline and a swollen edematous hole and a soft palate. So this swelling, as you can see clearly in this diagram, is full of us. So sometimes we are able to put in our finger and, and feel for fluctuations of this region, or fluctuations of this area. And uh, it, it could be cellulitis all, all, all pass. So some, we also go ahead and put in a needle at um, a line drawn. So you draw an imaginary line through the attachment of the ovula and an imaginary, the meeting point of the horizontal line through the superior pole and the attachment of the ovula. 
So that's why you put your, your needle and you aspirate. If you confirm it's past, then you go ahead and do incision and drainage. In adults, you usually do it in clinic. In children, you can you have to take them to theater to protect the airway. Uh, we also give the patients systemic antibiotics. We can give them uh, IV amoxiclav, all IV capraxone and metronidazole. As we have seen that this is infection is polymicrobial. Cold steroid IV dexamethasone to help reduce the edema. Uh, analgesia and also topical analgesics like BBC spray. It's a spray on the market. That is a strain name that helps to numb the oral cavity. Then we do also salty gargles just to improve in the oral hygiene. So salty gargles, usually we tell, inform the patient to make 500 mils of, of water. Then you put a teaspoon of, of salt in the water, you mix it and put in the mouth and, and gargle and spit. Um, later on, six weeks from, from, from management of the acute infection, we go ahead and do tonsillectomy. That is removing the tonsils so that the infection does not reoccur again. Um, complications of quincy include parapharyngeal abscess. So infection can spread to the parapharyngeal space, giving you a parapharyngeal abscess, which we shall see later. Septicemia, infection can spread to other parts of the body, giving you endocarditis, nephritis, or uh, we can have laryngoedema, we can have infection spreading to my, the mediastinum, giving you mediastinitis, uh, spreading to the jugular vein, which is close by, we shall see later, uh, giving you jugular vein thrombosis, and also infection can descend into the lungs, giving you pneumonitis and lung abscess. So peritonsillar abscess needs to be urgently managed. And as we have seen on antibiotics, a steroid, oral gargles, analgesia, both topical and systemic, and incision and drainage. And on a later date, when the infection is fully cleared, we treat the patient with doing surgical removal of the tonsils, which is called tonsillectomy. And complications, pharyngeal abscess, septicemia, laryngoedema, mediastinitis, jugular vein, thrombosis, lung abscess, and So we are going to talk about what we call the retropharyngeal abscess. Retropharyngeal abscess is an abscess that forms in the retropharyngeal space. As you remember, we say that we have a space that is formed behind your pharynx. You see it here, two, two so the three but between the vertebral muscles and a pre fascia. The danger space is between the pre fascia and the ala fascia. Okay, so collection of pus in the retropharyngeal space is what we call the retropharyngeal abscess. It's uh, commonly in children below the age of three years because of the retropharyngeal lymph nodes. As we saw, uh, the retropharyngeal space contains lymph nodes, but these lymph nodes are reduced and regress by the age of five years. So above the age of five years, we, we expect the, um, 
the, the occurrence of retropharyngeal space uh, abscesses to reduce. So in children below three years of age, we have uh, retropharyngeal lymphadenitis, uh, which is um, from infections in the nose, all the adenoids, that is, we saw acute adenoiditis, the nasopharynx, and the paranasal sinuses. So these infections drain into the lymph nodes, and the lymph nodes become superative, and they later form an abscess. Um, in adults, usually the risk factors for a retropharyngeal space one include um, regional penetrating trauma, so if someone is stabbed in the neck, or someone attempts to swallow a knife and it ends up cutting or causing trauma into the posterior pharyngeal wall and enters into the retropharyngeal space. They can also have post disease. Post disease is an infection that involves the cervical vertebrae due to TB and also endoscopic procedures. So endoscopic procedures can also introduce infection into the retropharyngeal space. So how will this child present? Children with retropharyngeal abscesses usually have, their, they come in with irritability, neck rigidity. As you can see, this boy, he's trying to, the neck is, is rigid and it, he has what we call torticollis, uh, fever, drooling and dysphagia, muffled cry because the abscess will be obstructing the airway and strider and, and dyspnea from airway compromise. And in adults, usually they come in with fever, sore throat, odinophagia, neck tenderness, and dyspnea. So <coughs> on clinical palpation, on all on clinical examination, as you can see in this image, this is an oral, this is an endoscopic, but think of it as oropharyngoscopy. This is an endoscopic view. But on oropharyngoscopy, if this wasn't, this is an ETT2, you can see. And then you see this is your epiglottis, the, the cartilage, the epiglottis, the cartilage of the larynx. So this is the epiglottis. This is your uvula. See the uvula? And then these are your soft palate. So you see this bulge? Okay, so as you can see that the bulge is limited to the left side, okay? So a bulge on the posterior pharyngeal wall usually seen on the on one side on examination. And you are, as you can see, the edema can extend all the way to cause upper airway obstruction. Um, if the patient is relatively stable, we usually send them to do a lateral neck x-ray uh, of soft tissue, a lateral neck soft tissue X, uh, imaging or radiography. And we are able to appreciate, as you can see here, in this image, uh, we are able to appreciate a widened, a widened pre-vertebral shadow. So you can see that this pre-vertebral shadow, which will be less than seven millimeters or, or in children and less than uh, 14 millimeters in adults has been greatly widened, as you can see. And also you see, you see air, Bubble. Um, so we can see, sorry about that. We can see air bubbles. You can see the air bubbles here. Sometimes we are able to appreciate an air fluid level. So the fluid it is the pass and the air will be up, but also you can appreciate the widening on the X-ray. Uh, in case this, this has, because we saw that the lower limit of the retropharyngeal abscess is the bifurcation of, of the trachea into right and left bronchus, sometimes these patients come complicated already with mediastinitis. And the symptoms of mediastinitis include dyspnea, that is difficult in breathing, chest pain, tachycardia, and as you can see on chest x-ray, <clears throat> you have a widened mediastinum. Um, treatment for retropharyngeal abscess includes systemic antibiotics. Usually we give IV capraxone and IV metronidazole. 
Uh, we give analgesia, IV paracetamol. We also give corticosteroids, IV dexamethasone uh, to reduce the edema. And surgical drainage of this abscess is done in OR. And tracheostomy in case of upper air obstruction is also indicated. So as we shall see in your last tutorial with Dr. Ruth, She'll talk about tracheostomy, and one of the indications of tracheostomy is upper airway obstruction, and retropendial access can also necessitate um, tracheostomy in case uh, you're losing airway without before intervention. However, we go to theater and we intubate the patient, as you have seen, and we may uh, uh, put a mouth gag. A mouth gag with its blade enable to open the mouth. And once they, they have opened the mouth, then we make a vertical incision. Remember, all incisions we are making in the neck, uh, in the head and neck for now are vertical. So that we don't injure vertical uh, vascular or neural bundles by cutting horizontally and then we separate them into up and down. So vertical incision is done, then you drain the abscess, then you uh, widen. Um, um, break the locus using an artery and then irrigate with pneumosamine and send the patient back systemic and and analgesia for at least seven days before discharge. That is for retropharyngeal abscess, abscess in the retropharyngeal space. Then we are also going to talk about the parapharyngeal abscess. Parapharyngeal abscess is a collection of pus in the parapharyngeal space. Parapharyngeal abscess is a collection of pus in the parapharyngeal space. So what is the parapharyngeal space? The parapharyngeal space is besides, besides not within, it's besides the pharynx. So as you can see in this image, kind of look at this. So these are the teeth, so this is the tongue. This is inside, definitely inside, right? As you can see, so this is your tonsil. So at tonsil, we see that this is your superior constrictor muscle, then you have your buccopharyngeal fascia. So just here, you have what we call the parapharyngeal space, and it, it has both the post-styloid and Freestyle spaces, which you don't need, but just know it, it contains the neurovascular bundles of structure that exit the brain or are going to the brain. So here, that's why you see you have the carotid, the internal jugular vein within the carotid sheath, and then you have the nerves, that is cranial nerve nine, cranial nerve nine, 10, and 11, they all exit the parapharyngeal space to come into the neck. And also you have your parotid. So this is a deep lobe of the parotid. It's also part of your parapharyngeal space, as you can see. So this is a space, it's a, an inverted pyramid. So it's a pyramid with a tip that is looking down and it ends it starts from the skull base and it ends at the greater horn of your hyaline bone. I hope you understand. Okay, so we said it contains the carotid sheath and it also contains the deep lobe of the, of the parotid. And as you can see, it's, it is connected to the submandibular space and it also connects the as you can see here, just close to it, it connects into the retropharyngeal space. So it is a gateway for spread of poorly managed abscesses in the neck. So infection on a parapharyngeal abscess can be as a result of maybe acute tonsillitis, quinsy. So a peritonsillar abscess can infection can pass through the superior constrictor muscle into the parapharyngeal space. Also dental infections, you see dental infection of the last lower molar, this one, it can also spread to the parapharyngeal space. Uh, basals abscess, basals abscess is the abscess in the mastoid, you see, has a relationship with the mastoid. So the mastoid can spread 
the parathyroid space, petrocytes also at the root, yeah, petrocytes. So in, uh -huh, as you can see, this is your mastoid, section from the mastoid comes through to the stenum. In the mastoid in the parathyroid space. Also, petro, the petrous bone, we saw it's part of the temporal bone where the ear is worn. So, infection in that petrous part just in here can flow downwards. Then we have para, parotid abscess. As we saw, that the deep lobe is part of the parotid. Infection from the retropharyngeal space, as we can see, we just have a direct communication of the retropharyngeal space with parapharyngeal space, and lastly, uh, penetrating injuries. So penetrating injuries can also harm parapharyngeal space. So how will this patient present? The patient will present with trismus, failure to open the mouth, swelling at the angle of the jaw, as you can see this lady, swelling at the angle of the jaw and medial displacement of the lateral pharyngeal wall. So an oropharyngoscopy, as you can see, we don't have any close life atrophy, but you see that you have a bulge in the soft palate and in both the anterior and posterior pillars because of the pushing of your superior constrictor muscle into the midline. Uh, other symptoms include fever, limited neck movements, and neurological deficits of cranial nerve 9, 10, 11, and Honor syndrome. Honor syndrome is when infection has gone to the, sim, the cervical sympathetic plexus, which runs along the carotid sheet. So how do we manage this patient? After, uh, we do a lot of series. So in this, slide, in this slide, we have not included the basic investigations. Usually we do like CBC, RBS, RCT, ESR, serial protein, markers of inflammation, and then we also do imaging, CT scan imaging, to see the location of the path. However, in clinic, you can also put in a needle and aspirate, confirm that it's an abscess, and start the patient on high dose para parenteral or systemic antibiotics. And if they do not improve, or if the swelling doesn't go down, then you take them to theater for surgical drainage. As we have seen, all drainages are done. So you make an incision here and then you move the pass, irrigate and send the patient back toward. So that is with the paraffin your space. So we also have submandibular infection or submandibular space abscess. Uh, so the most common cause of submandibular, so the submandibular space is the space between your myelohyoid, the myelohyoid muscle, and your subcutaneous, subcutaneous skin, skin subcutaneous and platysma muscle. So this space between these two, platysma and myelohyoid is what we call the sub mandibular space or the sub maxillary space. And above the myelohyoid, we have the sublingual space, which is between the myelohyoid and the flow of the mouth. So the commonest cause of infection in the submaxillary space is uh, dental caries. So the anterior teeth of first molar, infection from the anterior teeth of first molar uh, usually proceeds to enter the sublingual space and the sublingual space communicates with the submaxillary space so the flow, the infection goes directly into the submaxillary space. Also, we have infection in the second and third molar tooth and also go proceed to the submaxillary space. Organisms, the organisms include
So organisms, I am sorry about that. So organisms in the organisms in the submarine deep below submaxillary space, um, it's a mixed, it's a mixture of aerobes and anaerobes. So aerobes, we have the alpha hemolytic strep, uh, we have the Staphylococcus aureus, then the anaerobes, we they make synergistic effect of endotrophin dolphins and in immunocompromised patients we can also have gram negatives as part of the polymicrobial organisms in the in the infection in causing the infection so the clinical features uh, as we saw it is uh, sometimes progresses to ludwig angina so it starts unilateral and then rapidly progresses to bilateral. And um, we have indulation of the submandibular region and the flow of the mouth. So indulation means edema, edema. So you can see we have severe edema, wood edema of the submandibular region and also in the flow of the mouth, as you can see in this image. Uh, that is um, severe cellulitis. And then the tongue is thrusted or thrusted posteriorly and superiorly, causing upper airway obstruction. And we saw previously in the previous slides that we, uh, we put a tracheostomy for breathing in case we have pain air obstruction in lobings and angina. Other symptoms include drooling or dinophagia, trismus, and fever. Uh, Usually, no prurency due to no time in the development. So, the patients that disease usually progresses very fast as woody edema. Uh, management in early stage of submandibular cellulitis, we have unilateral mild swelling and edema. We just give IV antibiotics, like in this case, and then we extract the tooth that is infected. In advanced stage, we need to do surgical drainage as we saw in the previous uh, lectures and also early airway intervention by putting a tracheostomy before. So if this patient presents at a hospital, we shall put a tracheostomy because as you can see, the infection starts unilateral. It has rapidly progressed to the other side and extending to the neck, okay? So you need to protect the airway before you get laryngeal edema as we saw previously. So lastly, in the abscesses, we have um, parotid space in abscess or parotid infection. Uh, usually it's bacterial, from retrograde in the oral cavity. And remember <clears throat> that the, or the parotid gland opens via the stensin duct, which is opposite the second upper molar. That's papu that you see when you do oral pharyngoscopy. So sometimes when someone has poor dental hygiene and they are immune compromised or uh, elderly, infection will spread from the oral cavity into the parotid causing these parotid uh, intraparotid abscess, which we call the parotid space abscess. The patient will come in with high grade fever, lethargy, swell, swelling and tenderness of the parotid and fluctuants. And if you massage the gland, if you massage the gland, then you see pus coming out of the stents and duct. Our treatment includes IV antibiotics, and the antibiotics we choose, usually we choose macrolides because they have good penetration and they are also secreted in salivary gland. So you will combine a kephalosporin with a macrolide. And if uh, the, we have failure of improvement or we have continuous progression of the disease, then we do surgical drainage of, uh, of the what? Of the abscess. Um, complications of uh, deep neck infections include internal jugular vein thrombosis. 
Uh, why we saw that the internal jugular vein is just within the parapharyngeal space, which is close to the peritoneal abdominal space. It's also close to the retropharyngeal space. So because of the proximity of the internal jugular vein, so we end up having infections draining or spreading directly to the internal jugular vein, causing internal jugular thrombosis. We have cavernous cellular thrombosis. We saw that in your triangle. Neurological deficit we saw because, especially in the parapharyngeal space, because of the nerves that pass through the parapharyngeal space, they can get, um, they can the infection can spread to the nerves. So they will have loss of pharyngeal nerve nine. So they will have a uh, absent gag reflex, then um, drooping shoulder because the cranial nerve eleven will be affected or Horner syndrome. Those are. Um, neurological deficit. We can also have osteomyelitis of the mandible, osteomyelitis of the spine, that is if infection spreads the mandible and the spine. Then we shall have mediastinitis, as we saw infection can spread beneath, below to give you mediastinitis, pronoidema with, with pneumonitis and lung abscess, uh, we shall also have pericarditis that is in severe septicemia, aspiration of the pus in case a retropharyngeal abscess ruptures, and the patient can aspirate the pus and then they'll get a lung abscess, empyma, and all those other complications. And lastly, sepsis. So um, complications include internal jugular vein thrombosis, cabinet sinus thrombosis, neurological deficit, osteomyelitis of the mandible, Stimulitis of the spine, mediastinitis, pronoidema, pericarditis, aspiration, and sepsis. Okay, so we have seen uh, generally, we have seen pharyngeal we have seen quincy, we have seen septal abscesses, we have seen um, submandibular uh, space abscesses, parity space abscesses, retro and parapharyngeal. Abscesses and in all these abscesses, we have noted that um, we are both giving systemic anabetics and analgesia. However, we are draining the abscess, so there's no treatment of an abscess without drainage. Kindly remember, when you have an abscess, the best way to improve recovery of a patient is by draining the abscess. Uh, lastly, we are going to look at the thyroglossodact cyst. Um, the thyroglossodact cyst. The, uh, just to know what the thyroglossodact cyst is, uh, you need to remember that your thyroid, this thyroid that you see in this image, look at my cursor. This thyroid that you see in this image starts from the foramen cecum. Okay, so it starts from the base of the tongue. So at the base of the tongue, we have a place we call the foramen cecum. So the foramen cecum allows development of the thyroid gland. And the thyroid gland is directed by what we call the thyroglossal duct up to its location in the knee. So sometimes the thyroglossal duct does not dis disappear when it has finished its role of delivering the thyroid. And instead, it forms cysts, which are fluid-containing remnants of the thyroglossal duct cyst. Duct. So we can have thyroglossal duct cyst here in relationship to the hyoid. We can have suprahyoid, infrahyoid. We can have um, juxtahyoid, or we can have cervical in the neck. So a thyroglossal duct cyst, as you can see in this image, this is a, a Specific midline swelling, usually in the midline, as you have seen, that the movement of the thyroid gland is along is along the midline. So it's a cystic midline swelling, mostly affects young children, but may occur at any age. Rounded usually two to four centimeters in widest diameter, and it increases in size 
um, in upper respiratory tract infection because of its connection to the flow or the base of the tongue. So infection can spread from the oral cavity or the oral pharynx into the thyroglossodaxis if it's present. Uh, it moves with protrusion of the tongue because the thyroglossodax attachment remnant is the foramen cecum, as we have seen here at the base of the tongue. And the site's development starts from the foramen cecum, passes through the base of the tongue and descends in front, behind, or through the hyoid, to the thyroid gland. So anywhere along, we can have a thyroglossodax. So when it is infected, as we can see here, we have an infection ongoing. We usually treat with analgesia and systemic antibiotics. We try to resist from incision and drainage until it is more fluctuant and it's not resolving on, on 48 hours of systemic antibiotics. Then we give, we do IND incision and drainage. And when infection resolves, then we do complete surgical excision. So that is what we call cyst trunk. So you remove the whole cyst with part of the hyoid bone because that's where it passes, passes through and that reduces its recurrency. So this is a child with a, a swollen and infected because you see the skin is hyperemic and if you examine to be tender and if they protrude their tongue, it will move up because it's attached to the tongue. So when the tongue comes out, this when will move up. And if you give systemic antibiotics and analgesia for, but for, usually we treat them for seven days, but if you have no improvement over 48 hours, then you need to make a small incision and drain the pus. And uh, when the inflammation or the infection resolves, then you have to do surgical definitive management, which is silver lecture. Um, do we have any, any questions? Okay, Alex, Alex, good morning. You are asking what is the role of Vaseline in an anterior nasal pack? So the role of Vaseline or tetracycline ointment in an anterior nasal pack is to lubricate the gauze that is not rough in the nose, but also to give you um, an anti antiseptic that will prevent infection from spreading into the nose because the gauze itself is a foreign body. Okay, any question? Anybody? When is an MO supposed to refer a patient with an abscess? So a medical officer is meant to manage the following abscesses. One, parancho in the ear, you can drain. Parancho in the nose, when it's ready, you can drain. Septo abscess and hematoma refer refer to a specific to an ENT. A Quincy or peritone abscess appropriately diagnose and refer. Retropharyngeal abscess appropriately diagnose and refer. Parapharyngeal abscess appropriately diagnose and refer. So far on course, you can handle septal abscesses. You need um, other abscesses you need to be with um, maybe a surgeon or an ENT. Okay, do we have any questions? If we don't have. Paddy, are you there? Is, it, is everyone okay? Can I, was it understood? 
what precautions are taken in quinzy management in an adult? So the precautions we take in, so quinzy is a very as we have seen, and its management is drainage in clinic. Uh, precautions we take, one, we have to make sure the patient is consulted fully, that they consider the instructions given appropriately. So uh, you do oral pharyngoscopy, confirm that you have the bulge, uh, aspirate with your needle at, at that the junction we, we discussed. Um, notice that it is passed. In your syringe, then you need um, an 11 blade, which you have to seal off. So you measure at least 0 0.5 centimeters of, and then of 11, size 11, 11, um, 11. So then you make a stab incision into the place which is most fluctuant. So when you make the, the stab incision, then you enter with your artery and then you tell the patient to spit. If you have suction, then you um, do suction. You introduce the suction to that incision you've made, the suction, then you tell the patient to gargle some saline and that is it. Okay, after doing I and D in curricular abscess, you talked about suturing the cartilage. Can you elaborate? So after doing, incision and drainage of an abscess, which is the peritonsillar abscess, um, it will definitely reoccur again. So what we do is that when the patient has healed six weeks later, then we make the helical incision around and we remove, remove, the, the sinus, remove the sinus together with the cartilage. Remember the origin started from the cartilage. So if the, if the origin started from the cartilage, Kindly, uh, so, so after we've removed the, sorry about that. After we've removed the sinus, so because that sinus originates from on the cartilage, so you remove the cartilage and then you, you close the incision as you can see here. So the cartilage part comes after the invasion has gone. So, so you as a medical officer, you can do the incision and drainage of this abscess, but when it comes to removing the entire sinus, you refer to an EMT. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Okay. So, I don't think we are in your you are meeting, uh, and then tomorrow we shall see you in clinic. Uh, kindly remember your exam is on the 25th of October, so you prepare okay. as you go along. Thank you, sir. Hey, how are you? Were you hearing me? I'm good. Okay, now are there any other questions? Okay, so I can stop the share. 
Oh, okay, and how was the lecture? You guys understood. Oh, okay, as a little bit fast. Okay, thank you.